Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to be preaching from down here. Um, I like to be closer to, to the congregation instead of way up there, if that's all right with you. Well, as far as a, a new preacher, we're still working on it. Obviously, it's the new year, and that's always a good sign uh, because, you know, as the new year begins to roll, uh, there's more potentials, uh, candidates that we get to look into. And then the other thing is um, we also have, uh, we're going to be doing some redistricting. And so before we you know, get somebody in here, we want to make sure we are done with that. And so we're hoping to be done with that redistricting uh, no later than the end of this month. And then once we get into that, we'll, we're going to definitely look into, uh, uh, we've, well, we've been searching, but you know, nothing has come up at this point. But we are working on it. Hopefully, uh, we'll have someone soon uh, for your church. Well, listen, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And um, I want us to just get into the Word of God now. Obviously, I'm, I'm pressed for time. I have to be back in Benton by 11. But uh, I don't want to rush through it either. And so, if you bow your heads with me, we'll get into the Word of God. Father God, as we come before you this Sabbath, we want to thank you again for the gift of life. Thank you also for the gift of redemption. Because we all know that we're all sinners. However, we are sinners saved by grace. And so, Father, now as we spend some moments here in your Holy Word, I ask you to please be with us now and help me to hide behind the cross so that your children would hear your words and read your words and not mine. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you once more to go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and our brother read the passage already, but we're going to read through it again. And um, we're going to analyze this text from a different perspective, from a different context. As you all saw, the title there uh, of the sermon is, Don't You Dare Follow Me. And for sure, that might be a strange title, because we're used to reading in the scriptures the famous words, Follow Me. But you're going to see in a moment why I... Uh, Put the title of the sermon, Don't, Don't You Dare Follow Me. Once again, Matthew chapter 4, beginning there, verse 18. When you find it, please say, Amen. Amen. This way I know to go ahead, okay? Thank you. The Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now perhaps in all of Scripture, this phrase, follow me, is probably one of the most recognizable phrases in Scripture. I mean, we know, we, we've memorized verses, we memorize words, but this is probably one of the most recognizable also phrases in the Scriptures where he says, follow me. Now, this is kind of strange. I don't know if it's strange to you or not, but at least for me, this is a strange phrase, follow me. And I'm going to say it this way, because think about it from, the, from this perspective. 21st century Christian. For example, let's suppose that one day you're enjoying a picnic at some nice park. You're there with some, some friends or family, you're gathered together, and you're just having a good time. And suddenly, out of nowhere, someone comes to you, and this gentleman comes to you and he says, Come follow me. How many of you would follow that individual? Come on, let's be honest. No one. No one here would follow that individual? Absolutely not. Especially today in this century that we live in, right? Filled with crime and all this stuff that's going on. No one in our right mind would follow this individual. And so the question then begs, what in the world would motivate these guys to follow Jesus. I mean, they're fishermen. They're out there fishing. Why would they follow 
this guy Jesus? I mean, that's a valid question, right? We have to understand that question. But what's interesting is this, that in the times of Jesus, not only were these words significant, but these words were very valuable. And here's the reason why. We have to understand why they got up and left to follow Jesus. Because you see, in the times of Jesus, I'm going to share a little bit of insight of, of the, their educational system. Back in the times of Jesus, when children went off to school, typically the Jewish kids would go to the synagogues and that's where they would learn there from different subjects. However, we are told that when they reached the age of 13, their education stopped. And, for, and most typically, most of these kids would end up working in the, in the same line of work that their father or mother worked in. So for example, if their father was a fisherman, then that boy would become a fisherman. If the, if the father was a carpenter, then that boy would become a carpenter, and so on and so forth. However, there was room for growth. If there was children there that felt that they could continue their education, then they would try to advance to the next stages of their educational system. Now, in order for this to happen, though, a rabbi would have to take that, that child under his wings. And so, if the rabbi felt that this individual had enough brain, if you will, and they, were in, they had enough uh, energy to make it through the next stages, then this is what would happen. It's pretty interesting. This rabbi would come to this child, and he would tell the child, come, follow me. And so this child would follow this rabbi. And for the next several years, this child would study at the feet of this rabbi. Now, why was that so significant? Because you see, in those times, in those days, when this rabbi came and told the child, come follow me, what basically would happen is this individual would leave everything behind. Family, friends, their, 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 their uh, town, they would leave everything behind to follow this rabbi. Now, the words follow me in those days had some major implications. <coughs> what were they? Number one, if you decided to follow this rabbi, you were basically committing yourself to three things. Number one, you were committing yourself to imitate the teacher's life. Number two, you were also committing yourself to receive and live out the teachings of that rabbi. And number three, you were committing yourself to reproducing the teachings of that rabbi. Did you catch what I'm just saying? So you see, those words had major implications for those that follow the rabbi. Now, what's interesting is this now. We come to our passage of this morning. Here comes Jesus. He comes to this, to this lake here where, where Peter and his brother are casting their nets. They have been casting their nets and they've been fishing, right? And suddenly when Jesus comes to them, he says, follow me. Now, what's cool about this is this. Get this. The Bible says that immediately, what? They left what they were doing to follow him. But now check this out. How old do you think Peter and his brother were? They already by that time had wives. So it seems to suggest that they were either, you know, they, they were either 18 or over, right? But they were already older. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So if this is the case, then check this out. When Jesus comes to them and he says what? Follow me. It seems to suggest this. That Peter and his brother, when they were younger, 
did not have enough gray matter, if you will, for the rabbi for them to continue what? Their education. They didn't make the cut. Are you understanding that? In other words, they, they, they didn't have enough, uh, you know, smarts, if you will, to make the cut so that they could continue the rest of their education. Are you understanding me? However, here comes Jesus, and then those famous words fall upon the ears of these two guys, and they hear the words, come, follow me. And suddenly, they get up from what they're doing. And, and, and I, I could just imagine Peter and his brother looking around saying, who is he talking to? There's no, no one else here but us. And Peter and his brother leave everything they have and they follow Jesus. You see, here's the interesting thing. Because you see, in the times of Jesus, only the best of the best were called to follow a rabbi. But when Jesus comes to Peter and his brother, Jesus is not interested in the best. Are you understanding me this morning? Jesus doesn't care whether you are the, the, the you have you you have the, the greatest mind or not. Jesus doesn't care whether you are the best of the best. All Jesus cares about is the state of your heart. And if you are willing to follow him. You see, this is why I love this passage. Because you see, Jesus comes. To those who in their, his time had no more hope, he comes to give them hope. And he says, come, follow me. Now, what do these words, what are they, why are they, what, are they significant to us in 21st century today? Are these words significant? You see, we got to look at it from this perspective now. Because you see, the words there, to follow me, when you study that in the Greek, what you will discover is this. So, let me put it to you this way. If I come to you and I say, hey, come, follow me. All right? Is that an invitation? Or a command? It's an invitation, right? I'm inviting you. Hey, come, come follow me. And you, you decide to what? Either follow me or not follow me, right? It's a simply an invitation. But in the Greek, when you study these words in the Greek, what you will discover is that these words, when Jesus speaks them, they are not an invitation, but rather a command. Now, what's the difference between an invitation and a command? Right? It's a decision. If someone invites you, you either are deciding, you're, you're, you're given the permission to do something about it, right? To do some type of action. But with a command, it's not necessarily a permission. It's just simply what? Do as you have been told. And so when Jesus comes and he says, follow me, he's not actually giving them an invitation, but giving them what? A command. Follow me now. Let's go. And so you see, my brothers and sisters, when Jesus comes to us, he does the same thing. No matter what situations or circumstances you may find yourself, if he comes to you and he says, follow me, and he can come to you and say, follow you through, through a series of meetings or through the sermon or through prayer or, or through prayer meeting, doesn't matter how, he'll come to you and he says, follow you, follow me. You feel that in your heart. What do you need to do? You must get up and follow Jesus. Because he's commanded you. But at the same time, he's inviting you to what? Follow him. You see, now this is very important for, for us Christians here in 21st century as well. These words. And this is why I say, don't you dare follow me. Why? Because it has serious implications to follow Jesus. Why? Because you see, to follow Jesus also means that you are going to commit yourself to do what? To live out 
His word. Number one. Number two, you're going to commit yourself to imitate the life of whom? Of Jesus Christ. And number three, you're also going to commit yourself to do what? To reproduce His teachings with others. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You see, can I, can I talk to you strong today, church? Are you okay with that? Are you, oh, are you going to get upset with me? doesn't matter. I'm, I'm still going to preach it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. We got to understand it because this is serious stuff that we're talking about. It's about life and death, brothers and sisters. You see, because there are too many nominal Christians today, Amen. even within the context of the Seventh-day Adventist church. There are too many Christians out there that call themselves Christians, but don't live like Christians. You say, how is that even possible? Listen, it's possible. Because you see, I believe that unfortunately, our church in some places have become, rather than a church, have become a social club. That, in, that if you don't fit my certain mold, then we don't allow you to come in here. If you, you understand what I'm saying, if you don't live up to what I believe Christianity should be, then there's no place for you here. But that's not the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He said to Peter and his brother, follow me. These guys were considered to be outcasts in their society. Later on we're going to see he calls Matthew. He was a what? <laughs> Tax collector. Hated by the Jews. Hated by the church. What does Jesus do? He calls them. Come. Follow me. You see the church exists to do the same thing. To invite those who are being lost to follow Jesus. But it begins with us by what? Number one, we must learn to reproduce the character of Jesus Christ in our own lives. And what is that character of Jesus Christ? His righteousness that is enveloped in what? In love. For one another. Yes or no? Number two, to do what? To reproduce his teachings. Listen, if, if we are not doing our, the work of teaching others and sharing the good news of the gospel with others, then we ha we're messing up. Are you understanding me? Because if, if we just stay in the church and we huddle together every Sabbath and, and we come to church and we just greet each other with a smile and say, Happy Sabbath, but there's no other people being invited, no one else being let in, then we have failed at what? At the commission call of Jesus Christ to go call others to come follow him. Are you with me so far? Do you understand what I'm trying to say with you this morning, you see? And so it's a commitment to live out the values also of Jesus Christ. We must live out those values. But let's continue because I want to share with you other passages where Jesus invites these, these men and women to follow him. And it's interesting because we'll glean some interesting insights there. Go with me now to Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, we are going to look at verses 18 to 22. When you find it, say amen. <clears throat> amen. All right, notice what it says there. And when Jesus saw a great multitude about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, now check this out. This is one of the Jews, right? A, a, a scholar, if you will, a scribe. He comes to Jesus and says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, 
But the Son of Man has what? Nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the what? Dead bury the dead. What are these verses emphasizing here? To be a follower of Jesus Christ, what, what, what are these words emphasizing? That you must get involved. But see, th this is interesting because this is the cost of what? Of discipleship. This is the cost of following Jesus. That following Jesus is not always rosy posy. It costs you something. Are you following me? Because listen, all when I was a young kid, I would hear you know sermons all the time, and preachers would say, you know, oh, it, Christianity is a wonderful experience. Yes, it is when you have Christ in your life, you know. But but that doesn't mean that because you have Christ in your life, you are exempt from troubles of life. And the reality is that when you accept Jesus Christ, it's probably uh, true that you will receive more conflict in your life. Whether it's at work, whether it's, dare I say it, at church, uh, whether it's with your family as well. You see, following Jesus is a commitment to say, I'm going to trust Him, but I'm committed to go down this path even if it costs me Something. You see, this guy comes to him, this, this scribe, he says, Oh, I'll follow you. I'll go with you. But Jesus put him in his place right away. Listen, because I believe this guy thought, Well, if I'm with Jesus, man, I'm going to get some popularity here. And Jesus said, Look, I don't even have a place to sleep. Do you want to follow me? What was Jesus saying with that? It's not about what? Material things. I don't have that to offer you. Oh, it's not that he couldn't. But that's not what his kingdom is about. I don't have these things to offer you. I only have what? One thing to offer. Salvation. But it's not easy. You're going to sacrifice. You follow me? And so we learn that to follow Jesus is a commitment that it's going to cost something. It's going to cost you something. But listen, it's not difficult, right? Because Jesus did it all. He already, he already sacrificed everything for you. And all we have to do is what? Follow him but be committed to him as well. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Here's another example here. Here's Matthew. He's, he's being called here. And the, and the Bible says here, as Jesus passed from, on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And so he arose and followed him. Once again, pretty strange, right? Jesus doing everything opposite to what the religionists of his day were doing. He comes and he, and he calls this guy again, which the nation and the rabbis were disgusted with. Especially with this guy or these kind of people. Why? Because they were the tax collectors, right? that would take the money away but on top of that they would put an extra tax on the people so that they could skim and keep that money to themselves and so that's why the Jewish people hated these people and so when Jesus comes to him he says come follow me now this is also this is this is pretty cool here because what we see here is this that when Jesus comes to call this man what does it imply that the kingdom of God is open to whom? To every single individual. The kingdom of God is open to every sinner. Whether we like it or not. 
God has come to call the outcast. God has come to call those that have no hope. God has come to give hope to those who are in need of those. You see, I remember also, it's interesting, um, how many of you remember, or remember the phrase, tell me who you associate with and what? And I will tell you who you are. You remember that phrase? We, we usually use that phrase for what? We usually use that phrase to say, to tell people, oh, you, you see, it, 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 you're this way because you hang around with people that are this way. Are you following me? We use that, and there's some truth to that, sure. But what's interesting is this. You know, Jesus in his ministry, he was always accused of what? By the Pharisees. He was always accused of hanging around with whom? The holy people. No. He was always accused of hanging around with the sinners. With the prostitutes. With the drunkards. With the tax collectors. Are you understanding me? With the lepers. He was always accused of hanging around with those type of individuals. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to inspire hope in them. He wanted to give them what? The offer of salvation. And so, if this is true, shouldn't the church be about doing the same thing? You see, shouldn't the church be filled with people who have these, 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 these things that, that they're wrestling with, but yet they're being inspired with hope? Are you understanding me? You see, there's a difference between hanging around with these people to give them hope and being like those people. And that's what Jesus' example showed us. That he hung around with them. Not because he was like them, but because he wanted them to be like him. And that is what the church ought to be like. You see, so don't you dare follow Jesus. I'm going to say it to you right now. Don't you dare follow Jesus unless you're willing to commit yourself to live like Jesus. To walk like Jesus. To talk like Jesus. To spread the gospel of Jesus. All my friends... Follow me, the Bible says. What beautiful words to follow me. Now, go with me now to another one, Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to read there, verse 23, the cost of following Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, I'm sorry. When you find it, say amen. The Bible says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. Deny himself and what? Take up, Take up his cross and follow me. So, to follow Jesus means what in this context? To deny self. To deny self. Listen to what I'm going to say to you this morning, beloved church. The truth and the reality is this. Human sinful nature is selfish at its core. We're saved by grace. Praise the Lord. But even in that state, we're still selfish. And when Jesus comes here and he says, let him what? Deny what? Himself. What does that mean? It's not that you're depriving yourself from, you know, you're not, you're not becoming an, a, a, you know, a, a hermit, if you will. Okay, that's not what he's after. But he's saying what? Put yourself aside 
for the benefit of what? Of others. This is what the kingdom of God is. You see, so to follow Jesus means I'm going to put away my selfishness, my selfish nature, and for the benefit of others. So even if I don't like the way this sister looks, I'm still going to what? Love this sister. Even if she doesn't conform to the way I believe Christianity is. Are you understanding me? If this brother doesn't act the way I think he should act, I'm still going to what? Love him. Put selfishness aside. I'm going to reach out to him and try to gain a brother. You see, because this is what the kingdom of God is. And so to follow Jesus means to deny yourself. It means to put selfishness aside for the benefit of others. But notice also there, it says, let him take up his what? Cross and then what? Follow me. It means to take up your cross. Now we all, we all know the death of Jesus Christ was on a cross. And we know that in those times that, the, that to die on a cross was a horrible thing. But as, aside from being a horrible experience, it was also a shameful experience. Because those who were crucified on the cross were most of the time usually were there on the cross completely naked. To what? To demonstrate and make them feel embarrassed. It was a shameful thing. And so here comes Jesus. He says, let him deny self. Take up what? Your cross and follow me. But those are some strong words. They're not easy words. Because we don't like to be ashamed, right? But listen, we must be ashamed for the cross. Because Jesus did it for us as well. He gave us a great example. So take up your cross and follow him. That's the way to do it. There's no other way. It's not an easy process. I recognize that. Because look, selfish nature is always in conflict with the nature of God. Did Jesus want to die on the cross? No. Absolutely not. At the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? Father, if this were possible, what? let this come pass from me. But then what does he say? But not my will. Your will. You see, the reality is this. Human selfish nature says, no, I don't want to die at the cross. I don't want to go there. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you submit to him, you say, but not my, my will, but your will. And selfish nature is what? Crucified. And then we can say like Paul said, it is not what? I who live anymore, but whom? Christ Jesus, who lives in me. Are you understanding this this morning, church? All right. Ooh, it's almost time. I got two minutes. Let's conclude. Let's go to Matthew 19, verse 21, and, and we'll conclude with this passage. The Bible there in Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, this is the story of the rich young ruler, but we're just going to read the one verse here. Notice what Jesus says to this rich, what it says about this young rich ruler. He says there in verse 21, Jesus said to him, If anyone wants to be perfect, go sell all that he have, give it to the poor, and you will have what treasures in heaven, and come what? Follow me. So what does it mean to follow Jesus in this context? It means that we're always going to do acts of what? Kindness to those around us in our communities around the world because that's what Christianity is about that's what follow me means you see follow to follow Jesus doesn't mean that we just come and and and, and we sit and warm the pews of the church every Sabbath 
okay? It means that what? We are going to live out Jesus' values. It means that we are going to live out His will. And we're going to what? Reproduce His character and His gospel and share it with others. Do you understand now why I said, don't you dare follow me? Because what Jesus is asking for is for people that are committed. And I'm in the same boat with you all. Because I haven't made it. Obviously, I'm here. But we're all on the same boat. And so my plea to you today is that you would encourage each other. You would love each other. That we would become true followers of Jesus Christ. And when someone falls, that we wouldn't be down there saying, ha ha ha, that's what you deserve. But then you would just what? Pick them right back up and say, let's keep following. Let's keep walking after Jesus Christ. You see, that's what it means to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father God. We thank you that Jesus came to give us that hope. And we ask you now, Lord, please help us to be followers, true followers. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this Sabbath day.